Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm from North Yorkshire, and I'm a magician. Um, I never like to call myself that, though, um, because it conjures up, pun intended, uh, in my head, a fake, a phony, and a cheat. And it also makes audience relationships that little bit harder, yeah? People become more suspicious, less trusting, and ultimately won't believe a single word that comes out of my mouth. And I'm here to do a talk, so that's... With that in mind, if I was to ask you, would you like to see the greatest card trick of the 20th century, you probably would treat that statement with a degree of skepticism, and rightly so, because magicians have been uh, exaggerating their claims and their masterfulness as performers for, for many years. However, I don't make that statement, would you like to see the greatest card trick of the 20th century, lightly. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you at the back. Um, the reason is, it has to be, in my mind, the most significant and the most important and the most influential trick of the last hundred years. And the reason for that is it's indirectly affected the lives of everybody here, pretty much. Uh, and the, the, the reason for that is it influenced one man. And it's this man right here. Now, he was the face of magic hundred years ago. And some of you may recognize his face. If you don't, you might recognize his name. His name is Harry Houdini, born Eric Weiss in Budapest in 1874. He traveled to America uh, when he was still only a child, and he began his performing career at the age of nine uh, as a trapeze artist. He was known as Eri, Prince of the Air, and he was a trapeze artist in a local circus. Um, he changed his name. Eri became Harry, and Vice was dropped altogether, actually, for Houdini, which was a name taken and modified from um, his sort of magical hero, the French magician Robert Houdin. Um, his late teens, he changed his name and title from Prince of the Air to King, the King of Cards, and he performed solely card tricks, nothing else. To places a bit similar size as this, I guess. Card tricks, card trick after card trick, all night long. Um, and it apparently went down a storm. Um, whereas now I think that would be a serious sort of, you, you, you know, pretty good to do something like that. Um, I'm not going to do that. Um, but he, uh, he nonetheless left that world of card tricks behind and went into the more dangerous world of escapes, and that's really what we all know him for, uh, for escapology. Um, there's a few speculative reasons as to why uh, Houdini may have left this world of card tricks behind. And one of the reasons is sort of the fear factor. He was being approached a lot by people after his shows, asking him, please tell us how you do that, but not in that kind of, you know, tell us how you do it way, sort of offering vast sums of money to do certain things with the secrets that he might tell them. Um, raid casinos and gamble and hoodwink and card shark their way through life. And Houdini decided against telling them anything uh, on principle and for any criminal activity. But one night he was cornered by two men after a show at the back of the theater and they drew a gun on him and they said, we want you to tell us how to switch a deck of cards. We're going into a casino and we'll share the money with you but you need to tell us how to do this. And the grisly incident that ensued ended up in Houdini being shot uh, in the hand, luckily. Uh, this here is a, an x-ray taken by Houdini's brother, Leopold, who was a doctor. And you can see there the sort of lead shot bit of fragment, whatever it is, in the palm of Houdini's left hand. Um, and he escaped other than that without injury, but he carried that bullet, apparently, for the rest of his life. Um, so some magicians believe that it was all this attention he was getting, unwanted attention, that caused him to leave the packs of cards behind. The fear factor, though, for me doesn't cut it, because if you're getting shot in the hand, why then go and bury yourself alive and try and escape? It doesn't just seem to make logical sense. So I much prefer the idea that, as he was known as the king of cards, perhaps it was a card trick that maybe inspired him into taking that leap. Now, I have no proof, I have no evidence, all I have is theatrical license, so we'll see how this goes. I have here a deck of cards and a few other bits and pieces. Um, here we go, a large deck, hopefully, so you can all see this at the back. Um, 
There we go. He didn't use cards like this. I don't think they were around then. Um, I do would like to make someone here. They don't have to come up, although it would be handy. I've been told I must not leave the stage. Um, so I'm going to leave this up here. Maybe someone from down the front. Maybe yourself on the end there. Well, what's your name? She's looking this way now. You're right on the end. What's your name there? Sorry. Casa. Casa. Please, Casa. Round of applause for Casa. Casa, if you wouldn't mind signing your name real big on the ace of hearts here, and don't breathe the fumes of that pen for too long. That's it. And top on, brilliant. Round of applause for Casa. Thank you very much. Oh gosh, leave that on there, hopefully so you can see to dry. Houdini would then take a card of opposing colour, um, and he would sign his own name. So let's see. Uh, for example, I'm going to put that pen there. He's not here tonight, so I'll sign his name for him. Okay. Houdini was like, thank you. Was that a clap? <laughs> thank you. We'll let that dry. Um, and there's a few other things that come into play here now. So essentially, we'll leave poor Casa there and take Houdini and slide him into a straitjacket or an envelope, if you like, if you, if you prefer. We'll take this, place it onto a clipboard, which I've stolen from work, and we're going to fire staples into Houdini. And I think in Houdini's time, he would have used uh, hammer and nails. This is the modern-day efficient and fun equivalent. So here we go. All right. I've never done this myself. I always get a member of the audience, but it was just too risky, apparently. So here we go. All right. Something to the effect of that. Let's do one more round of applause. My hand's now stuck to the back of this thing here. Um, it actually nearly is. Uh, so, Houdini, in a straitjacket, on a brick wall or a clipboard, peppered with nails. I did mention that this, though, might be the trick that inspired him in taking the leap, into leaving the packs of cars behind and picking up the padlocks and chains. Casa, would you mind just coming up here and spinning yourself around for you? Glamorous isn't there. Indeed. Thank you very much. And just to be sure, it is always the glamorous assistant who comes off worse, isn't it? I do apologize for that, Casa, but I just ripped this open. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you as well. Oh, so perhaps that's what happened. That's why he made the leap and went down that route. Um, I did a show this year at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival for the, for the first time. I had been before just to watch, but I decided to, to pluck up the courage and go and, and do an eight-run uh, slot at a place just off the Royal Mile, Surgeon's Hall, um, and it was a little small room, and I basically performed a show called From Houdini to Potter, and it opened with a confession, and the confession was this, that magicians have been lying and cheating as myself, and deceiving their way through life for years. And I asked the audience, why? For what purpose? What is it that drives these magicians into this life of deception, basically? Um, and I went through several magicians leading up to Harry Potter at the end. Uh, I've only got time, really, to linger on the great man Houdini, so I'm going to carry on with him, if you'll, if you'll permit me. And he, he sort of shows off the point, I think, to the, to the greatest effect. Um, it may be hard to believe, but Houdini had three loves in his life, and the first love, this is the hard part, was magic. It wasn't a person, it was the art of magic. His second love was shared between two people, uh, his wife, Bess, and his mother, Cecilia. Um, his mother is the one on the left, just in case <laughs> you were wondering. Um, and he called them his two sweethearts. Uh, and when his mother died at quite a ripe old age, Houdini was performing abroad for the Dutch royal family. And after the show, which apparently had gone very well, he received a cable from America telling him that his mother had sadly passed away. And he was completely distraught by this. The fact that he wasn't there by her bedside, that he couldn't have that last kind of bit of closure, that last conversation with her, he was around the other side of the world. And he grieved for years afterwards because of that. 
Um, he visited, as well, several spirit mediums, apparently people who could contact and commune with the dead in the hope that he could have that last conversation. He quickly realized, upon visiting several mediums, that they were using magical methods, fraudulent methods, to make it appear as if they were contacting his mum. But it was all an illusion. So his hopes of that conversation were absolutely shattered, and he sort of exacted a bit of revenge on that and went on a massive expose of mediums. He wrote books and journals and newspaper articles and he went to seances and shouted abuse across at the medium because he felt it was wrong that they were making money out of people's suffering and bereavement. It's not a noble thing to do. Um, there was one such medium who he found maybe the hardest to, to decipher, really, if I can say that. And that's the lady in the middle there. Her name is Minor or Margaret Crandon. And this picture was taken outside of Minor's house uh, in Boston um, as she looks rather furtively towards Houdini, which is who's stood here over on the right. Um, Houdini was there to view a seance conducted by Minor. And the two chaps behind her are two members of the Scientific American who are there as a kind of independent committee to see whether or not uh, Minor had genuine psychic ability or whether under the glare of Houdini she was a fraud like everyone else. Um, she would open often with a trick that asked the audience for a name of a person, usually dead, who she would then contact and ask lots of little questions, gossipy questions, um, that then the audience would find entertaining and love and perhaps believe. Um, I've asked a few members of the audience here tonight, you know who you are. Uh, often they were waiting in the queue for the food. Um, so I thought, you know, they wouldn't mind doing this. Um, to write down a name of a famous person, alive or dead, on a piece of paper, correct? A few people are saying, great, okay, yeah. I got, I got about 20, 30 people something. You can guarantee when I leave here tonight and go back to my two-star hotel, the first thing I'm going to do is make a cup of tea. The second thing is I'm going to look at all these because it is quite interesting. I'm, I'm sad like that. So we've got here, somebody's written Wiley Kit. Who wrote this one? <laughs> Own up. I can't see, actually. Is somebody putting their hand up? Wiley Kit, they've gone home. Somebody putting their hand up or not? Oh, I'm going to read another one just so you don't think I'm faking it. Who is that anyway? I don't know who it is. Oh, Thundercats. Oh, okay, okay. I still don't know actually. But, um, we'll, have, we'll have one more. Here we go. Oh, okay, let's have a look at this. So we've got here. Okay, Michael Barrymore. Is it bad that I know Michael Barrymore and not Wiley Kit? Okay, all right. I need someone here to just pick a name for me. Um, maybe someone else from the front row, as we're short of time. Would you mind coming up here? Oh, we better not stand too near that. Uh, just reach inside and grab one of those little tickets. Sorry, I'll hold it lower. Have you got one there? Would you mind opening that? You can go back to your seat. Just double check for me that there is a name on there, and it doesn't say something like, penis or anything. It's, it's, it, there's a name on there. You don't have to say who it is, but oh, it says penis, does it? Oh, it doesn't. Okay. I was worried there. There's a name? Legible? Yes. Okay, great. I'm going to now perform Miner's opening trick, the one that she did in front of Houdini um, for you all tonight. I like to do it in the traditional manner uh, by if everyone wouldn't mind holding hands with the person next to them. Thank you very much. And now we're all getting to know each other. Um, what I'd like... Oh, this is causing a right ruckus, isn't it? I'll just have a drink while you sort yourselves out. Mm. Ah. What I'd like you to do, please is just take a deep breath, everyone. Take a deep breath in and out. And in and out. Lovely, okay. I will need complete silence for this to work. Thank you.
Mina would equip herself with a piece of paper and some scissors. She'd stand very still. Slowly, she would start to cut the paper and she would ask the spirit, whoever it was, written down on that little name there, to reveal itself. She would cut haphazardly at first. There was no rhyme or reason to her actions. Slowly, pieces would begin to fall to the ground. Houdini and the other members of the Scientific American would look on perplexed as to what the medium was up to. Folding, cutting, a cold sensation would enter the room. Her face would become rigid and contort, and she would stare out into the audience. Thank you very much. The lady down there, you picked her name. Winston Churchill, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Some magicians do lie, cheat, deceive, swindle, and otherwise scam their way through life. But that's not the reason uh, for their way of existence, really. That's merely, unfortunately, the necessary evil that is required to frazzle the minds of their audiences, and hopefully frazzle in a good way. Um, I felt that the driving force behind magicians uh, was deeper than that. And I felt that it was the wacky old reason of um, immortality that drives every magician to perform. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but just hear me out for a sec. When a magician shows you a magic trick, he or she is hoping to show you something so astonishing, so astounding, so miraculous, that it will be seared into your mind, not just for fleeting moments, but for years to come. They are hoping to create a lasting memory, if you like. Houdini epitomizes the magician that has achieved that kind of sense of immortality. Throughout his life, he cheated death countless times by escaping from packing crates thrown into the Hudson River, or from safes wired up to explosives, or being shot, or being buried alive. He almost had that immortality, that invincibility about him. He also said many times that his greatest magic trick would always be to come back from the dead. And despite dying over 80 years ago, He's still very much this kind of global phenomenon, which is remembered. And it is that, really, that selfish reason that every magician really wants to uh, be remembered for their performances. Um, and that's where I'm going to finish. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Good night.